work of the therapist is mm -hmm. to understand who we are first, where our blocks are, what our traumas were. Nobody comes through childhood unscathed. Yeah. Everybody has something going on, mm -hmm. but it's how they learn to deal with it. It's You're saying that, again, therapy doesn't work, or if it does, certainly not the way we expect it to work. Well, therapy certainly can work, and it can be powerful some, for some people, but not in the way that most therapists, including most patients, think about it. Because um, if you realize that a relationship is really this biological, physiologic link between two emotional brains, then you, suddenly therapy appears in a whole new light. It's not just two people talking to one another, having a conversation. It's really this wireless emotional link, and what's being performed in the therapy should be an experience of relatedness that's different than what the person experiences outside. And that's really the, the changing aspect of theory, or the, the mutative aspect of therapy, is that new relationship. Not, uh, say, any particular insight, right. or any particular intellectual So, so it's knowledge. not the content of the therapy, per se, that may be helping. It's the fact that over time you might become more like the therapist. Precisely. Which is stable and reasonable and... Precisely. If you have a stable, reasonable therapist. Right. right. Not right. everybody does. But people probably ought to be aware of that and ought to try and choose their therapist with a lot of care and discrimination because essentially you're asking to become more like that person. Relationships have a kind of grammar to them or a kind of internal structure or coherence. And what happens between two people has a regularity in it that's discoverable. Uh, the brain of a child studies, if you will, the relationships that are going on around him or her and pulls out the regularities and learns those uh, regularities or rules just as they learn the rules of their native language. Depending on the kind of family you have, that may serve you well or it may not serve you well. And if emotional interactions in the family take place that are, ex are eccentric or are um, not really valid when applied to the, the larger world, people will not be speaking the same emotional language that everybody else knows. And uh, in our practices, we see a lot of those people, they're often baffled about how relationships work, what goes on in them. They don't understand what they don't know. Often they don't know that there's something they don't know. An attractor is that um, kind of intuitively acquired, ingrained pattern um, of implicit memory. Say if you grew up in a family where when you expressed your opinion, somebody yelled at you. Um, you learn something from that. It's not just that experiencing it is unpleasant, which it is, but your brain learns actively um, about what the structure of the world is like, what you can expect from a given um, interaction, and it changes how you see the world forever. Um, and one of, the, um, one of the actions of attractors is not only to prepare people to act in a certain way, but they also alter incoming sensory information so that um, people don't see reality. They see sensory data that's been filtered and compressed by their attractors into much simpler things. And if your attractors are not accurate, say, you won't be seeing the real world very clearly. Uh, some form of toxic shame, they have addictions. Mm -hmm. They may be addicted to pain medication, some kind of psychotropic. They may be addicted to some kind of uh, other kind of pill, alcohol, yeah. some kind of drug, something, some kind of compulsive disorder, mm -hmm. which addictions usually are, mm -hmm. or a personality disorder. So they take, you know, there are many different manifestations. So in, in other words, what you're suggesting is underlying many other clinical problems, the issue is shame. Absolutely shame, and we, mm -hmm. we tend not to look at it. As, as, a, as a psychotherapist and someone trained in psychology, uh, all the way up to a PhD uh, in clinical, I find that we have never had that as part of the curriculum. I don't recall a, a course on, on shame, that's for sure. So this encoding of the limbic system is malleable. It can change and adapt by constant interaction with the compatible limbic system of another. In a relationship, therefore, one mind revises the other. One heart changes its partner. This incredible phenomena is known as limbic revision. Our attractors activate certain limbic pathways and the brain's memory mechanism reinforces them, 
giving us the power to remodel the emotional parts of the people we love. And if you don't know, now you know.